Hello, Serious Survivor here, and I've got some very interesting information to share with everyone. We've all heard about the solar winds hack. Uh, we've heard about what happened with Kaseya a few days back. We've heard about multiple, probably hundreds if not thousands of different cyber attacks over the last year or two or even three years. We know that this is a problem that's growing as intensely if not more than other problems that we face at this moment. We are in the middle of so much right now in this nation, in this world, that it's hard to focus on one thing. It's watch this hand while the other does something else. And every time we hear about a ransomware attack, then something else happens overseas that dramatically affects us too, and we don't hear about that and vice versa. So the information is so spread out and people are not able to dig in deep in a lot of this because it's so intermittent. It'll be reported on for one day and then skip for a few days and then while something else is reported on. So it's really hard to get the actual facts and get the perspective correct. This video I'm gonna read directly from two emails that I received from a anonymous source. I will call that source codename Angel. And for the sake of maintaining the anonymity of the source. And it's very, very eye-opening. And it really does bring some things to light and it makes us question a lot. And it also puts us in a slightly different scenario than some may have imagined initially. This person is a IT security expert, a person that works in the field directly and was involved directly in the solar winds and the Kaseya hacks. So we're gonna, I'm gonna read these emails and we're gonna talk a little bit about it and then I guess we can draw our own conclusions from there. And it begins, remember this is correspondence, so it begins as, I'm also working at an MSP that was affected by the Kaseya hack yesterday and have a few thoughts and suspicions about this hack and the solar winds hack. Our MSP was using SolarWinds software just prior to the attack and going back for five years. We were in the transition to Kaseya software as the SolarWinds attack surfaced. So Angel had a close look at both software platforms. I don't believe either of them were done by Russia or any state-sponsored factions. It would make no sense to do it the way that it was done if it were a non-American entity. I believe that both hacks were intended to target and systematically crumble the SMB markets and those responsible left evidence intended to point the blame towards an enemy and off of themselves. And that makes perfect sense. As for the Kaseya hack, I believe that it had been laying dormant in systems for at least the past two months, perhaps longer. Our malware protection systems were red flagging Kaseya files back in April and May for behavior that was like ransomware and then again in the past couple of weeks, a traditional antivirus software also flagged and quarantined the main BSA software from Kaseya. We submitted the file to their analysis team, but Kaseya come back with a decision saying that it was simply falsely flagged as malicious. We also submitted to, I'm going to call this, Blocker this proprietary software that I cannot give the name of. We submitted to Blocker, which had flagged the file and process behavior as ransomware. So this Kaseya VSA software was already being flagged as ransomware two months before this attack ever happened. But once again, Kaseya called this a false positive. I remain unconvinced though. And two weeks ago, a bundled version of McAfee Live Safe also flagged the same quarantine files. I find it very unusual that so many malware engines would make the mistake of falsely flagging a well-known and commonly used RMM file, as it would be incredibly disruptive to the industry that uses their software platform. I think it's more likely that folks at Kaseya were looking closer at it, but got hit from behind while their attention was distracted. And that was the end of the first email. There are already doubts as to whether or not this was actually done by Russia. Um, it's being blamed towards Russia. But if we think about something, Biden gave Russia a list of things not to hack. And what happened? They all got hacked just, just very shortly after that. And then Biden said, we're going to retaliate. And it's been a week and nothing has been done and barely even a word out of the administration about it now. So what's this retaliation going to be? I'm not sure if there's going to be one because maybe, just maybe, it didn't come from Russia. Maybe it came from somewhere a little closer to home. So now I'm going to read the second email. Angel goes on to state that Angel had been working in information security for the past six years and in the initial stages of that began to master the RMM software, remote monitoring and management software platforms. And this platform was the SolarWinds Enable platform, the one that was hacked. It's a very powerful and complex system built on SolarWinds Orion platform 
And at the time, SolarWinds was a growing private company and did not have a lot of guidance in place for new customers. A couple of years ago, SolarWinds went public, and with that, prices went up. At that point, Angel transitioned to Kaseya's platform, the VSA, and it was very comparable to the functionality of SolarWinds and less expensive. I was not thrilled with that decision since I had done a little bit of digging and did not care for Kaseya's business model. And as we were in the process of moving everything from Enable to Kaseya, the news broke of the Solar Winds hack. So as this company was transitioning from Solar Winds Enable platform to Kaseya's VSA, then that's when the Solar Winds hack actually took place. So they hastened their transition to Kaseya and took the Enable server offline. I of course dug into the specifics and technical details of the hack since security has always been my main focus by choice. The whole hack seemed to me to be doing things the hard way. If the reported end results were to be trusted, it seemed to me that it was inefficient and awkward to use the path they took to get the assumed data payout when using a more direct route could have allowed them to sit in the background unnoticed and given them far more control over many systems. And you have to understand that this information is coming from someone that's worked with both of these systems and worked with the security aspect of both of these systems. So this person knows exactly what they're talking about. And I know this person's background and, and I'll tell you that this person knows a lot more than I do about IT and IT security and is very efficient in the field. This is pretty serious here. To me, it looked more like the efforts of a former developer who was specialized in just one part of the platform, more like corporate espionage than a nation state attack. And you know, we have to think about that. When a, a nation state attack, if Russia is behind these hacks, then these hackers or attackers have all of the funding, it's not gonna be as difficult for them to hack into something as an individual, a small group, or someone trying to cover their tracks. Someone trying to cover their tracks and point it at someone else is gonna take ways in and leave little bits of evidence that actually point towards you know, another nation, another group, or something to that effect. Fast forward about four months. One of, the big, one of our big clients were hit by a ransomware attack called Tripoli at the end of May. Another thing that we heard nothing about on the mainstream media. It was a really bad attack that we're still having to tamp down here and there. We implemented a powerful next generation malware software, once again codenamed Blocker, to get control of the infection. To our dismay, codenamed Blocker flagged and quarantined two of the core files that were part of the Kaseya RMM based on ransomware-like behavior, such as lateral network movement and privilege escalation. And basically what lateral network movement is, is when you gain access to one part of the system and instead of, instead of trying to go deeper into the system, you move laterally, basically side to side, say from one level of access in one department, maintaining that same level of access, moving into a separate department and attempting to escalate from there. Privilege escalation is basically that, like the difference between a guest user and a register user on a website. But these are behaviors that are also consistent with normal functionality for a system that must have system-wide access and network visibility in order to fully monitor as attended. We submitted the file for further access to codename Blocker to verify whether it had been infected. We also submitted the files to Kaseya for investigation, but it seemed unusual that codename Blocker would not have exclusions in place for a software platform that was so widely used. Nevertheless, both stamped a clean bill of health on the files and deemed them false positives. They were whitelisted from future scans and Kaseya was allowed to run unhindered again. This never set well with me. Then about two weeks ago, I was setting up a new computer out of the box for a client and installed the Kaseya agent and opened it to reconnect the computer. The pre-installed McAfee antivirus software flagged and quarantined the Kaseya again and disconnected me. Now McAfee is not a behavior-based scan engine. It's based on virus signatures or definitions that are written when a new virus has been discovered to be infecting machines. It's based on recognizing code within the file that is consistent with malicious actions. Someone would have to actually analyze the code in the file and determine it matches code written for malicious purpose. I again submitted the files, this time to McAfee, and it was again deemed a false, a false positive. This made no sense to me. Then Friday, while we were having a rare in-person meeting, the VSA, SAAS, the Kaseya VSA, 
SAAS Software as a Service server that holds our instance of the Kaseya platform went offline. It first went offline for emergency maintenance due to a bad patch. Then later in the day, they reported it was a minor security incident, and then the news broke about the overwhelming capacity of the attack. And here we are. Now this is a, uh, you know, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, we really think about it. We've had some massive cyber attacks over the last year, um, especially this year so far. We've had some really massive ones. Kaseya is probably the biggest this year. It's probably one of the biggest ever is what they're saying. And for these types of attacks, if this really were the Russian government, then it seems like we would have some sort of retaliation against it. I'm not saying a military retaliation, but something. The last attacks that happened from, were claimed responsibility by our evil, you know, supposedly the Russian hacker group then nothing happened. Uh, the, the companies paid the ransom and we heard that they might have got the money back, but nobody really knows that for sure. So just food for thought. And you know, not everything is as it seems. And these days when the government is telling me one thing and all the news, especially mainstream media is telling me the same thing, I, I have to start thinking a different way because they've told us the same thing and it turns out to be absolutely false. And then they just basically act like it never happened. We we'll all have our opinion on this. In my opinion, this makes sense. It seems like it is definitely a possibility and it's something that I'm going to dig a lot deeper into. Make sure to catch the live stream Saturday night. We're going to talk a lot more about this and a lot of other important topics. Thanks a lot for watching. God bless. And for now, Serious Survivor out.